we go live. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Glanville. I am the manager of the Future Students Office here at Douglas College. I am joined by my student staff member, Melissa Cocking. We are so happy that you guys have joined us for our webinar today. Thank you so much. Uh, we have participants from coast to coast today. I was taking a look at the registration list, and we've got folks from seven different provinces. So it's fantastic to have people from all over Canada joining us for a conversation about how to engage students through an online orientation. We've got lots of content. In fact, we actually had to cut back some of the content that we had originally planned for today's webinar because uh, we want to make sure that we are keeping it to about 30 to 45 minutes and giving some time for discussions at the end. However, if you have questions about anything that we're talking about, feel free to use the chat area to type those questions in as we go along, and we'll stop and try to answer questions at various points along the way. Uh, we were going to add in some poll questions this morning. Uh, but I think that at this point we've got so much to go through that we'll probably just get straight into the content for today. So if we'd like to get started. As a quick introduction to Melissa and I, uh, as I mentioned before, I am the manager of the Future Students Office here at Douglas College. I actually began my career in orientation as a student uh, volunteer at Simon Fraser University in the 1990s and spent six years running new student orientation programs there, and I loved it. I love taking a group of students who are maybe a little bit anxious and uncertain about their experience at the college uh, and getting them to a place where they are excited and confident about the year ahead. So after I graduated from SFU, I actually went out on the road and I worked as an orientation trainer and keynote uh, presenter for a number of different institutions across British Columbia. I had a great time meeting some great people and being part of some fantastic programs as well. Uh, and then in 2007, I ended up here at Douglas College. Uh, as part of what was then called the Office for New Students. And we had three different portfolio elements. We had orientation, domestic student recruiting, and the Student Ambassador Program, which is a group of student leaders that helped us to run both the recruiting and the orientation. So that's a little bit about me. Melissa, what about you? I am currently a Douglas College student in my third year in the Future Teachers Program, hoping to be an elementary school teacher. And the reason I am in this presentation for today is because I actually got to the chance to work with Eric as his student staff uh, within the Future Students Office. And although I actually now work at the Students Union here at Douglas, um, I still volunteer under Eric. And I'm happy to have created some of this uh, content. Fantastic. Thank you, Melissa. Well, at this point, typically when I'd be doing a workshop, uh, we would go around and we'd do introductions. It's a little bit different because we can't actually see any of you folks today, but in our mind's eye, we're imagining that you probably look something like this. Uh, you know, incredibly strong, handsome, beautiful, intelligent student affairs superheroes who have enjoyed the love and respect of small children and furry animals everywhere. Uh, I'm not even going to bother pulling on that. I know that that's true. Um, so thank you, all of you superheroes, for joining us this morning. We are going to move on to a bit of an overview of what we've got in store for you today. So essentially, we're going to start by giving you a little bit of background information on the college, our orientation programs, and how we got to the point of developing an app-based orientation program. Then we're going to run right into a demo. And hopefully, a lot of you folks had the chance to actually download uh, the app before we got started this morning. That will give you the opportunity to actually go through the technology on your own device. If you didn't get a chance to do that, feel free to do that in the next few minutes. Essentially, you're looking for the Douglas Students app on either the App Store or Google Play. So once you've got the Douglas Students app installed, you'll be able to follow along. We've also put screenshots of all of the demo onto the PowerPoint slide. So if you don't get a chance to put it on your phone, you can follow along on the PowerPoint as well. Once we're done with the demo, we're going to talk about outcomes, what actually happened when we put this service in front of our students this year. Then we're going to uh, jump under the hood, and we're going to take a look at what actually uh, we did in the months leading up to the launch of the program in order to develop the service and the content uh, and, and what we did behind the scenes in order to make the program happen. And in the last few minutes that we have together, we're going to have a general Q&A where folks can ask any questions that we want, and hopefully we can answer the questions that you have. So that's our outline for this morning. And to give you a little bit of background of Douglas College and what we face in our institute, uh, we are a college based out of British Columbia uh, with two campuses out of New Westminster City as well as Coquitlam. 
Uh, we have about 15,000 students, with about 25% of them being international students. And our community is mostly traditional students, so students straight out of high school. And we have uh, certificates, diplomas, degrees, uh, post-diploma degrees, as well as university transfer courses in uh, the following programs, arts, science, business, performing arts, child, family, community studies, and health sciences. And our campuses look a little bit like this. That's our New Westminster campus, and that's our Coquitlam campus. But the best part about our campuses, of course, is the lovely students. So with our students, we're able to create these live orientation events, um, as well as host them for these um, new coming students. Absolutely, and that's definitely my favorite part of the community as well as the students that we have the joy of serving on a regular basis. So. Why don't we talk a little bit about the orientation programs, just to give you folks a, a big picture background on what that looks like for us. So no matter what type of program we're running, when we're running it, what audience we're working with, we generally have three goals for all of our orientations at Douglas. The first is to deliver critical information, information that they need in order to succeed in their first uh, few weeks, in the first semester, in the first year that we're in our community. Secondly, is to build key relationships, to so really introduce them to peers in their program, to student mentors, the faculty and staff that can help them be successful, and give them a sense that they're a part of a community here at Douglas College, in addition to just a place where they're taking their classes. And the third major goal is really to provide opportunities for those students to get, in, to get engaged, to get involved, to start becoming an active member of the community here at Douglas. So those are sort of the three goals that we keep in mind for all of our programs here at college. And a little bit of background on our live events. Uh, we have a lot of different orientation events that we host um, as, um, on our campus. So starting off with our early summer orientation, uh, which is a lot of getting students um, familiar with how to like course register, as well as getting them familiar with our campus of campus tours. Uh, we have parent orientations, which is dedicated to parents of uh, incoming students um, just getting them familiar with the new roles that their children will be playing in college and how that differs from their high school experience. Uh, we have our mature student orientation, which focuses on our mature student population and some of the issues and difficulties that they may be facing coming into college or even the first time or the first time in a really long time and how they balance their life with uh, either work or family and that kind of stuff. Um, then we fall into our late summer orientation, uh, which is our traditional orientation, which we host about 1,000 students on campus, giving them the practical resources that they'll need to know for their first week of back, um, at school. So things like getting their textbooks, getting their student IDs, um, getting familiar with the campus layout, um, as well as just starting a community between those students. And then we have our international and varsity orientations, in which our partner offices uh, cater towards those demographics. As you can see, quite a wide variety of programs that we run at the college. And the good part about the campaign that we have with our live events is that we do have a number of different events that are tailored to the needs of unique populations at the college. And we get a lot of great feedback on them from students that attend because they're very interactive, they're very engaging. The challenge, of course, is that here at Douglas College, Participation in these programs is voluntary. Students are not mandated to come to any of these programs. And what we found over the first few years was that our participation rates had started to plateau at about 1,000 students, especially for new student orientation in August. And that represents somewhere between a half and a third of the total incoming population. So we weren't seeing a large percentage of the students. It was a good number, but it wasn't as many as we'd like. And the other challenge, of course, and I've heard this from so many people working in the field, is that there's just not enough time to cover all of the important topics that you'd like students to know about in the time that you have together when they're physically on campus. So what we did was a few years ago, we actually surveyed the students who didn't attend orientation, and we asked them about their experience. And they told us two interesting things. The first thing they said was that they actually recognized that orientation was a really important step in their process of coming to the college community. But the problem was they just didn't have the ability to attend a particular event at a particular moment in time, either because they were working, they were traveling, especially in the case of the international students. In some cases, they weren't even in the country when we were running the orientation program. So given that they weren't able to attend a particular live event, we asked them, what else can we do for you folks in order to um, help you succeed in your first semester? And the most common response we got at that time was, 
can you create an online orientation that we can access at our convenience? So that became our focus roundabout in uh, 2012, actually, was when we started this process. And between 2012 and last year, we actually experimented with five different models of online orientation. And we discovered that there are strengths and weaknesses to each of those different approaches. So for example, the very first thing that we tried way back in the first year was to create an online orientation on our website. So essentially, we created a bunch of different web pages on different topics, easily 15 to 20 different pages, each on a different topic, um, to try to give students the information that they needed to succeed. And what we found was that website-based website orientations, online orientations, they were cheap, obviously, because the platform was already available. It was easy to use because we could ask, access it directly. The problem was it wasn't particularly engaging. It was essentially static text content with maybe a couple of videos. So it wasn't the most exciting orientation in the world, and it really didn't capture their attention for very long. So the second thing that we tried in order to try to fill the gap a little bit was we purchased a license to something called Uversity, which is an app that actually doesn't even exist anymore. It was bought out by Hobson's, which is a big student affairs company down in the US. But if you want to try to imagine, it was an app that was kind of like your Facebook wall in that it was a place where students could log in, they could create a profile, and they could chat with other students or they could chat with students and staff. And we saw actually a lot of uptake of this technology. A lot of students downloaded the app and they used it to make friends and to ask questions, which was awesome. It was very social. The problem was, as you can imagine, with a Facebook wall, it's not particularly educational. We couldn't throw a lot of very detailed content into that format. So it wasn't educational, and it was, it was rel relatively expensive, given that it really only did one thing well. So that was sort of a good piece of the puzzle, but it really wasn't a great solution to the problem. So at that point, we moved on to trying to host it on our learning management system, which here at Douglas College is Blackboard. And I know that this is a, a, a platform that a lot of students, a lot of institutions use. And the advantages that we found of putting content into our LMS, first of all, again, just like the website, it's cheap because we already have access to that technology. And obviously, it's educational. And LMS is designed to deliver large volumes of curriculum out to a student population. So that was effective for that particular goal. The problem was it wasn't particularly engaging. There wasn't a lot of interaction that was available through the platform, and it really wasn't very mobile. Um, so they, they did have sort of uh, a format that you could view through your web browser. They even do have an app, but if you've ever used the app for Blackboard, you know that it's fairly rudimentary and it's not all that engaging, not all that user friendly. So again, some strengths and weaknesses there, but not the solution we were looking for. So the next thing that we tried uh, is a webinar format. And I know that there are some institutions that do great online orientations using a webinar. So we tried this for the first time about two years ago. And we actually ran it like a, almost like a local television program in that we were on camera for two hours, interviewing different guests from the campus, interviewing students, doing a panel. So it was very interactive. Um, students in the virtual audience could ask us questions using an online chat forum. It was educational. We could communicate a fair amount of information to them during that two-hour time period. So that part was really good. The problem was it was very time-limited. It was time-limited in the sense that students had to be available at a particular moment in time, and they had to be available for the full two hours of the webinar. And especially for international students, that could be very difficult, because even though it was daytime for us, it was sometime during the night for a lot of the international students around the world. So it had some strengths and weaknesses there as well, but really wasn't a perfect solution either. Now, the last one that I don't talk about too much in general population, but it is part of the story, is that I was so committed to the concept of creating a truly inspiring and informative online orientation that I may have invested $12,000 of my own money back in 2015 trying to build an app that would do all of this. The short story is, it didn't work, but I learned a tremendous amount about working with online technology, working with the developers, and building a product that's really engaging, really informative for the people that are going to be using it. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to other people, but it was a tremendous learning experience. And I think what I can say about the whole last seven years of our experience on five different platforms is there was a lot of trial and error. We had some success. We had some challenges but we learned a lot about how to make a really engaging online orientation. And if I were to distill everything we learned in seven years down into four or five bullet points, it would be more or less this. Uh, first of all, 
If you're going at this for the first time or you're looking to really transform your online orientation, try to have a lean approach. And this is actually a term that is used a lot in technology and startups. It's actually based on a book um, by Eric Ries called uh, The Lean Entrepreneur. And what lean means essentially is rather than spending a lot of time and a lot of money building a platform and building content that is very robust and perfect, and then putting it out for the first time to your student group only to discover that maybe they will or won't use it in the way that you want, the more efficient and cost-effective way to approach it is actually to build something very cheap, very easy, and very quickly, and put it out as soon as you can in front of a student audience, and then watch how they use it. Learn from the, what they're using, how they're using it, and then build another iteration that builds on the success of the first and leaves behind the things that didn't work. That way you're not wasting a lot of time and money in building the perfect model, because it's not the perfect model, nobody actually uses it. And I've certainly been frustrated by that outcome many times over the years. So try to come at it with a lean perspective. Build it quickly, build it very simply, and then watch how these students uh, use it and iterate and improve it over time. Second thing that we learned was make it essential, especially for programs that are not mandatory. The students will have to be self-motivated to use this program. And what we've learned is that the best way to trigger the internal motivation of the students is to focus on things that are their hot buttons. And I'll talk a little bit later about how to identify the hot buttons that are really going to attract your students and get them to use it on a regular basis. But the more you can focus on the things that the students themselves perceive as critical to their success, the more likely they'll be motivated to use your online orientation, not just once, but over and over again over time. Third thing that we learned early on, and this is tied to hot buttons, is to tailor it to different audiences. While all new students at your institution probably have similar core needs, there are different groups on campus that have unique needs to themselves. So for example, international students are probably really interested in things like accommodations, maybe transportation, medical insurance. Varsity students will be interested in things like eligibility to play on their teams. So those are unique to each student. And if you can provide tailored information to those groups, it makes it even more valuable and attractive for the students to use, much more likely that they'll actually engage with the content that you've provided for them. Next thing is to make it practical. Um, and probably the best way that I can describe this is um, good technology educates, but great technology enables. And a good example of this would be the banking apps that a lot of us have on our phones. I'm pretty sure that we have banking apps on all of our phones, but we don't have a banking app because the app explains how credit cards work. We have the app because it allows us to pay our credit card bills on a regular basis any time of the day or night, anywhere we happen to be standing, or lying down. So it provides that convenience to take care of critical needs. And so I think that as much as possible, if we can create tools that enable students to execute critical functions and to take care of critical needs, they will go back over and over again to use that technology because it's not just informative, it's also practical and helps them achieve their critical needs. Next up, and we learned this early on with our experience with university, is to make it social. Uh, what we saw early on was that if there was an easily accessible social element to the online orientation, the students flocked to it in droves for a couple of different reasons. First of all, a lot of the anxiety of coming to a new school is not knowing if you're going to be able to make friends and not really understanding the important concepts when you get there. So if you can provide an opportunity for students to connect with each other in real time before they even arrive on campus, it really reduces that social anxiety and gives them a lot of confidence that they're going to do well because they're building those relationships, those social connections, that sense of community before they even arrive at your college, institute, or university. And this is especially true for internet national students. Just think of all the things they're leaving behind when they're coming to your institution. They're leaving behind friends and family. If they have the opportunity to start building those friendships and building that sense of family before they arrive, they will flock to that opportunity. We saw that early and we saw it often, so we consider this to be a critical element of any really effective online orientation. The last thing that I'll mention is make it mobile. Um, and probably the easiest way to describe why this is such an effective strategy is this. Students will use a laptop or a desktop computer when they have to. 
But students literally sleep with their mobile phones in their hand. They've got this technology with them 24 hours a day. So if you're looking for a platform to put your online orientation on, why not choose a platform that you know they're going to have in their hand constantly? It just makes it that much easier for them to use the technology and that much more likely that they're going to go back to it over and over again over a long period of time and get the information and the support that they're looking for. Oh, and one more bonus tip for you. Always try to make it with someone else's money. That's just generally a lot less stressful, especially if you're married. Actually, that's, I'm just kidding about that. My wife was tremendously supportive during that process, uh, but she probably questioned my sanity. So these are all the things that we've learned over the seven years that we've been working on different platforms at Douglas College. And putting all of this together, I had a pretty good sense in my mind of what I thought the ideal online orientation would look like. And so about a year ago, I started to pursue the program that we're going to focus on today, and that was a partnership with an organization called Ready Education. So this is essentially where the rubber hits the road. This is what happened in the last year for us and brought us to the demo that you're going to see in just a few moments. So two things that I want to say just at the very beginning. First of all, the foundation of the success that we had in the last 12 months is in no small part due to the contributions of two amazing people and two great organizations. First of all, our Douglas Students Union actually was using this app for many years before we got uh, connected to it. And specifically, Tracy Ho, who works for that organization, she's a staff member there. She did phenomenal work in building a lot of the content that was in the app before we arrived. And she just did a great job at investing time and energy into this technology and building a really great platform on which we could place our online orientation. Secondly, of course, is Ready Education themselves. And I was dealing specifically with Sophie, who is my program liaison, and she was phenomenal. Um, she took a lot of information and a lot of requirements, and she worked with them incredibly quickly. And what I'll say about Ready Education that is really kind of a unicorn experience with them is that unlike a lot of different groups I've worked with in the past, they really understood two critical elements. They understood what students needed, what students got engaged engaged and excited by, and they also understood modern technology and how to place all of this on a technology that is very immersive and very engaging for students to use. So they were a fantastic partner in developing this latest version of our online orientation. So what did that actually look like? Um, we actually began the conversation for the first time in August of 2017 with an exploratory conversation with both the DSU and Ready Education where we explained exactly what we wanted to build with an online orientation program. And it was a pretty ambitious project. Uh, I was a little bit worried that they would run screaming from the room, uh, but I was delighted to see that they actually got very excited by the opportunity to work on this project and they wanted to get started right away. But what we actually needed to do first would go through a bit of a contract negotiation. Essentially what we were doing was we were setting up a contract that was not only in agreement with Ready Education, but also a third party being the DSU. And so it took quite a while for us to work out the right contract that would work for all parties. We finally got that signed off in January of 2018. And we began the development process in February of 2018. So that's when the team actually got started building what you're about to see. And we actually launched the first version of this product in April. So actually only about two and a half months from the very first day that we started working on it, we were able to put a basic version of the product out to our summer cohort starting about the middle of April of 2018. Then based on the feedback that we got from the first cohort, we built uh, additional elements to it in the summer and we launched it to our large fall cohort in August of 2018. So a pretty quick cycle from the very first conversation to delivery to our major class entry in the fall of 2018. So that's what it looked like in terms of the roadmap. You're probably at this point saying, well, okay, that's fine, good to know. What does it look like already? So for those of you who had the opportunity to download it before we got started, feel free to open it up again and take a look at it now. For those of you who maybe didn't have that opportunity, don't worry, we've got all of the visuals on the screen here and we're gonna go through it together. But if you've got the chance to do it on your own phone, I'd highly encourage you to do that. Not only is it gonna give you an opportunity to see what the look, but also the feel of this technology is for the students that are in the environment. So the whole process, begins on the home page, which is what you see in front of you. And there's a whole bunch of tiles underneath that that we're not going to bother showing you right now, but some great content that was built by Tracy Ho and the DSU in previous years. The part that we're going to focus on is what we built as our online orientation, and that is actually under the blue tile at the top left-hand corner that says New Students Start Here. So we're going to click on that blue tile. 
Now, the very first thing that I'll point out is that, remember, one of the things that we found to be so critical to get students engaged is to give them tailored information. So the very first thing that students see when they enter the online orientation is an opportunity for them to tell us what major student groups they belong to, because there's actually tailored information for each of these groups within the online orientation. So we, as an example today, are going to use the domestic students, but there's different stuff there for international, varsity, aboriginal, mature, and transfer students. So we're going to click on the domestic students and take a look at what they can see. So underneath that is what I call the tool menu. And this is one of the things I was most excited about in working with this platform and working with Ready Education this year was that it gave me the opportunity to create what I refer to as the Swiss Army Knife of online orientation. It doesn't just do one or two things. It actually does 10 different things as part of the orientation experience. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that there's even more in the second half of the menu. So lots of different things that are in here. And they're all designed to achieve either different goals for the students or different goals for us as an institution at Douglas College. But we're going to start right up at the very top under the new student guide. And we're going to click on that and get into the main menu for the new student guide. Now, this is the primary area where we deliver critical content to the students. So you'll see that there's a lot of different topics in here. And these were chosen based on what we knew were the hot button topics, the things that students were most critically interested in when they were first coming to the college, the things that made them stressed and anxious that we could take care of. So lots of different content in here. The one that we're going to focus on for the time being is transit and parking, which is the fifth one down. I think that's a good example of some of the content that we're providing. And what you'll notice when you get in here is that content's available in two different formats. There's an introductory video that goes through a lot of the different content. We know that students love to watch videos to get educated on different subjects, so a lot of our topics have videos to support them. But we also have text-based information. And the text-based information is really designed to be action-oriented. You remember that I talked about the utility of making your app as functional as possible. So the text is actually designed to help them move through the steps of getting these things accomplished. And it's designed uh, to support four different questions. Essentially, it starts with, why is this topic important? Then if you scroll down, it talks about how did they get this thing done? A little bit below that, it talks about when is it important for me to do this? Or are there deadlines that I need to know? And at the very bottom, it has help. So essentially, where do I go for more help if I need support in getting this important activity finished? So all of the topics in the new student guide are organized in this way to give them critical information that they can use to actually move through the process and make progress towards the beginning of their first semester. So that's how the new student guide works. It's primarily information driven. If we X out of both of those back up into the tools menu again, we'll get down into the second tool, which is the checklist. Now, checklists have been around forever. I certainly didn't come up with this idea, but I've always found them to be a really effective, action-oriented tool, not only to help students do the things that we need them to do, but also to bring down their anxiety. So much of student anxiety is that students don't know if they're ready to start. Whereas if you can give them a list of things to accomplish, it gives them a sense of competency and completion that really brings their anxiety down a lot. And just like the new student guide, this is an area where the content is tailored. So for example, in the new student guide, we would have sections on housing and transportation and medical services. On the checklist, the international students would also see a tailored list of things to do that are unique to their particular needs. So both the new student guide and the checklist are fully tailored to the unique needs of the population that's looking at that content. Really simple format, easy for students to follow. So we click back out of there. And we get into the third part, uh, which is the chat room in our main menu. Now, the chat room was definitely one of the most popular parts of the app this year. Hundreds and hundreds of posts, all kinds of answers, likes, questions, everything you can possibly imagine got um, put into the chat room this year. And one of the things that I really like about the chat room is not only does it give students a sense of community, a place to make friends and ask questions and get answers, but in many cases, Students were answering each other's questions before we even had a chance to jump in, which I think gives students uh, a really strong and tangible sense that this isn't just a community, it's a supportive community, it's a collaborative community, it's a place where students help each other be successful. And that's not something that I can try to sell students on 
theoretically, um, it's only something that they can experience. And it's fantastic to have them experience that before they've even begun their first day on class. So lots of activity in the chat room. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's exactly what that looks like. So getting back out into the main menu again, the next option down is dates and deadlines. So if you click on that, for those of you on an Apple device, it'll take you straight to the main list. If you're on an Android device, you want to click that last option, see all. And what this is, is a tailored list of dates and deadlines for domestic students, a different one for international, different one for varsity students. They can scroll through, they can see all of the important dates and deadlines in the next two semesters, and they can actually add this calendar to their main calendar. So they don't actually have to go back and check it. It prompts them automatically through their main calendar once they've added this to their calendar. So a really, really useful tool to keep students on track and make sure that they're doing the right things at the right time, depending on who they are, if they're international, domestic, varsity, what have you. So lots of great stuff in the calendar. Jumping back into the main menu again, the next tool down, contests and prizes. I'm sure that many of you have all kinds of contests that you run with your new student populations, and we found that they work just as well in the online format as they do in our live events. So in our first year, we had two contest that we ran to really build uh, uptake and engagement in the online community. The first we called our chat room champions, which essentially prizes that students got for posting questions or posting comments in the chat area. The second contest we called feedback superstars because we really wanted to hear feedback from the students about what they liked and what they thought we could improve about the product. So that was the second contest that we ran as well. So a couple of different contests that we ran, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but we kicked it off with an opening weekend contest so that students got in right at the very beginning and were highly incentivized to get involved, to start making friends, and to start posting and engaging right from day one. So clicking out of there and back into the main menu again, we move down to the next section, which is social media. Now, I know that all of you have fantastic social media channels, even, even uh, either at the institutional level or at the departmental or program level. The challenge, of course, is that students need to open a bunch of different apps to check out the content that you have on all the different platforms. What we thought might be more effective was to bring all of that content together in one place. So we put all four of our main college social media channels into the app itself. And if you click on the one at the top under Twitter, what you'll see is it takes them directly into our college Twitter feed. So that means that they can see all of the information in one place, super handy, super easy for students to access from within the app. If you click out of there, get back into the main menu again, next tool down on the list is college slang. And like any institution, we've got a bunch of terms that are kind of unique, insider type terms that you'd only understand if you were a student here at Douglas College. And obviously, when students are encountering this for the first time, it can be intimidating, it can be confusing. So what we did was, this is another area where we created tailored content for each student group. So the domestic students have college slang that they're likely to run into. International students have their own glossary of terms that they're going to need to know. Even the varsity athletes have terms that are unique to that population. So each of them will see a tailored list of words that they need to know and understand in order to succeed in their first semester. Getting back out into the main menu again, next option down is clubs and activities. Now this was a really interesting aspect of our experience this year. We saw a lot of demand and a lot of activity under clubs and activities. And again, this makes sense. Students are looking for a way to create relationships, to create a sense of community, and they really want to get involved and meet other students that are interested and passionate in the same issues and topics and activities that they are. So students really went after this content in a big way. So we put lots of different options in here, information on how they can get involved in field schools, leadership programs, special events, and student clubs. There's actually a different part of the app that's back on the main menu for the entire app that Tracy built a couple of years ago, where students can actually see all of the student clubs that are available at the college, and they can actually join the club through the app directly, which means it's super easy and efficient for students to get involved. So a lot of uh, really good response to this part of the app this year. So if you get back out into the main menu again, the next tool down is Video Showcase. And we know that students love to watch videos on important topics, and we just happen to have a bunch of videos that were shot for our student engagement awards over the years. So these are students telling their stories about really interesting and fantastic accomplishments that they've been able to do while they were students at Douglas College. And if you click on the first one at the very top, Aaron and Rodrigo, you'll see that students not only get a text introduction to their story, but they can actually watch the video where students talk about their experience 
here at the college and what they got out of it as a way to try to inspire students to think about college as being more than just the courses that they're taking, but who they can become, who they can meet, and what they can accomplish together here at Douglas College. So this is why we created that as sort of an inspirational element of the online orientation. Getting back to the main menu again, you'll notice that the very last tool at the bottom of the screen is our feedback option because, like I said earlier, the secret to this is to keep it lean, to start simple and then use feedback to make it better and better and focus your time and resources on the things that are providing the most value and take time and resources off of things that aren't. So we wanted to give them an easy way to share their feedback with us through an online survey that can, they could access directly through the app itself. So that is kind of a whirlwind tour through all the different elements of the online orientation. And again, we built that in about two and a half months. Uh, when I say we, I should say the outstanding people uh, that we were partnering with at Ready Education. They worked really, really quickly to get this up and running. Now, we worked really hard to create that over a two and a half month period. What we didn't know was how students would respond. We really didn't have any sense of whether we'd get good uptake on this. Obviously, over the years, we tried a lot of different things. We got good and bad results with each of them, but never really got the sort of reaction that we were looking for. So we had our fingers crossed, and we were hoping for good results. We put it in front of the first cohort of the summer intake in April, and at that point, we started to see the results, the actual outcome. So I thought I'd take a moment to share what we actually saw with our students here at the college. So the first outcome that we wanted to look at was just how many students actually went and downloaded the app? We sent out a single email letting them know that this option was available, this service was now online, and we kind of crossed our fingers and hoped for the best. And probably the best way to understand what we saw in terms of the outcomes is to compare what happened when we launched the online orientation to what happened in the previous year with the same app. So that's sort of our benchmark, was what happened the year before we launched online orientation and then compared it to what happened in 2018. So for 2017, uh, and I should explain that the summer 60 and fall 60 refers to the 60 days that straddle the first day of the semester, because typically you'll get your most uptake in the 30 days before the semester begins through the first four weeks of the semester. So in the 60 days around the beginning of the summer semester last year, they had about 291 students download the app. In the fall of last year, they had 1,489, and from the beginning of April, through to about the end of November, which is where we are now. So in that period in 2017, they had a total of about 2,487 students download the app. So that was our benchmark of what we were um, thinking we might see when we launched our orientation this year. This is what we actually saw. So for our summer semester, we saw over 1,000 students download the app, which is a 270% increase from the year before, simply by adding online orientation into the mobile platform. For the fall cohort, we had almost 2,500 students download the app, an increase of 62%. I actually think the number is probably much higher than that, because I think a lot of students actually downloaded the app earlier in the summer, because of course it's publicly available to students at any time, but that's simply the number of students that downloaded it during the 60 days around the beginning of class. And from the beginning of April through to the end of November of this year, we've had nearly 6,000 students download the app. Um, so it's a 130% increase in uptake this year versus last year, and the only change has been the addition of an online orientation into that service area. And the other thing that um, I'm really excited about is that this represents roughly 75% adoption rate in both the summer and the fall cohort. Um, so really, really good uptake there. Really, really happy with that. Next up, really quickly, um, our outcome results in terms of, it's one thing to get students to actually download the app. It's quite another thing to get them to use it and to use it regularly. So the first thing that uh, we asked them in our surveys afterwards was, how often have you actually used the app? And in the summer, I actually gave them three options because I honestly didn't think they would use it that much because we hadn't gotten a lot of uptake in previous years. So we gave them three options, and here was their response in the summer. Actually, 95% uh, of the students indicated that they had used the technology five or more times. And if I had known that it was going to be used that much, I definitely would have given them more options. But we were super excited and blown away by those results. We'd never seen a technology that students came back and used that much after launch. So we were really happy with that. 
In the fall, we actually expanded that and we asked them uh, more detailed questions and got even better responses. So you can see that 37% uh, of the students uh, are using it multiple times a day and an additional 24% are using it at least once a day. So a huge number of students aren't just going there once like they did with our LMS, they're actually going back over and over and over again and using this as a tool. So we're really excited by that. And it actually was even better when we looked at just the international students. As you can see, over 80% of our international students were using this technology at least once a day, if not more often. So this is really, really um, encouraging stuff that we're seeing out of the international student population at the college. Um, I know that we are um, moving fairly rapidly through our time today. So what we're going to do is we're going to move really quickly through um, some of the testimonials that we saw. Um, I think the, the quickest way uh, to get uh, through this is to skip through the testimonies a little bit and talk a little bit about how we actually built the system. So um, we'll move through this. Um, essentially, we just asked students to tell us what parts of the app they used the most. Um, then we asked them what they liked about those elements of the app. The chat room got lots of great feedback, not just because um, students were connecting with each other, but they were actually getting practical things done. They were able to find things like their textbooks. They were finding their apartments. So some really practical application to the interactions in the app community. Um, they also talked about things like the new student guide being very comprehensive and practical, the checklist being an easy to use tool, and clubs and activities giving them the opportunity to actually meet other students, especially if they struggle with making friends for the first time. All right, so let's dive in the last few minutes into the design process here. Um, so there are a few different things that we went through in order to get from an idea in our heads to what you saw in the demo today, and I'm going to go through them really quickly. First stage was identifying what were the hot topics, what do we think students would be most interested in, and what tools were going to be most effective in helping them be successful. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we found those hot topics on the next slide. So we'll move. Once we had those um, hot topics identified, the next thing that we did was we built a very comprehensive mock-up of what we wanted the experience to look like for students and how we wanted it to work. In fact, it was 34 pages of information that we supplied to the folks at Ready Education for them to work with. And then we started to discuss the plan and talk about what was feasible, what could we achieve in the early rounds when we just wanted to have a simple model and what would we design later. Then they actually went and started building it, and they built it in segments, and we reviewed each segment of the build as it came along and gave them feedback. And then once it was complete, we tested it very rigorously to try to find any bugs or to any typos or anything that we thought might trip up students using the product. We launched it to them, and the final stage, of course, was looking at the outcomes and suggestions and using that feedback in order to essentially go back to stage two in the summer and create some new mock-ups with some additional ideas and start the process all over again. So that's what it looked like to actually build what you saw from idea to reality over about two and a two and a half months. Uh, in terms of identifying our hot topics, um, there are a few ways that you can get there, and I'm sure a lot of you have done research like this before and you have a good sense of what it looks like, what students are looking for in your online orientation, but here are some of the things that we found to be useful. We took a look at the Google Analytics behind our online orientation web pages or other web pages on the site to find out what student information they were accessing most often. So we use that. Secondly, any conversation that we came across on social media or in the chat rooms of the apps themselves, a lot of the times it led us to topics that maybe we hadn't considered before, but was a hot topic for students to discuss, and that led us to certain areas for the new student guide. We also looked on the click-through data for each uh, area of the online orientation to see which tools were actually uh, used more often, and we put more time and energy into developing those. Uh, of course, we surveyed the students after they'd gone through the process to find out what they liked the most and what we could improve. Uh, and even our live orientations, we looked at the sort of questions that we got there or the elements of our live orientation that were most important uh, or had the most student involvement, and we built those into the online orientation as well. Here's an example of some of the design documents that we actually gave to the developers at the beginning of the process. And like I said before, they included both a visual outline so that they could see what we wanted the students to see and what we wanted it to feel like, and then a lot of information about what we wanted it to do and how we wanted it to respond and the sort of information we wanted it to provide to the students. And this, I think, helped to accelerate the development process because it helped the designers understand what we were looking for, both visually and from a functional standpoint. 
uh, I'm very quickly going to share with you another tool that I developed along the way, which is a simple test to evaluate the completeness of your online orientation. So if you're halfway through the process and you're trying to figure out, are we ready? Do we have everything that we need? Um, this is something that I created, um, and I call it the Glanville test simply because the reality is I'm never going to discover the cure for cancer or a major mountain range or even where the socks go in the laundry. Um, but I discovered this one little tool, so I'm going to stick my name on it, and here's how it works. Um, all you need to do is take a plain piece of paper, fold it down the middle to create two vertical columns. And at the top of the left one, you write down my online orientation. On the right, you write down my live orientation. And under the left column, you start to write down the three things maybe that uh, you've got in your online orientation so far. So let's say you've got a course registration module, a new student checklist, and a campus map. Then you ask yourself, well, what would it look like if these three elements were actually my live orientation? So in the first case, your course registration model module might be a workshop. Your second checklist might be a pamphlet. And the campus map might actually be a campus tour. And then I asked myself at that point, well, if this was our live event, would I consider that to be a best practice live orientation? Or would it be achieving all of the goals that I need my students to get to in order to be successful in their first semester. And if it didn't, I started to write down what are the other elements that I would look for in a good live orientation. So I wrote those down afterwards. So in this case, there were four different things that I wrote down. Uh, so it might be a group building activity, clubs and opportunities fair, keynote address, maybe even student ID production. And the final stage was to ask myself if those would be really valuable as a live event, what might they look like in an online orientation? And then I mentally converted those back into an online format. So group building activity happens in a social or a chat area. A club's fair might be like club's information online. A keynote address is probably an inspirational or a welcome video. And student ID production, if you've got the technology, you could actually do it online as well. And so that list there becomes kind of your roadmap for the next thing that you would focus on in your online orientation. So a simple little tool that I used to use in order to get a sense of how complete my online orientation was and where I needed to focus my attention next. All right, really quickly, um, the marketing aspect of what we did. Um, I'm going to just go through this super fast, a couple of quick tips that we discovered were really effective for our marketing. First of all, um, we got much better results when we had a dedicated marketing program. Um, so rather than burying it with all of the other content that you send out to students, if you send them something that is specific to online orientation, it tends to get much more attention that way. Secondly, just like your content is tailored, your marketing needs to be tailored. So if you're sending out information about online orientation to international students, focus on things that are a unique need for them, like how to find housing or transportation or medical. Launch at the moment of highest need. I'm sure all of you folks are already doing this. So if you put it out there too early, students don't have the intrinsic motivation because they don't see that they need to focus on this yet. So typically we'd launch within about 30 days of the beginning of the semester. And finally, run an opening weekend contest. We definitely learned that if you can build critical mass right at the very beginning of the process, it helps to build momentum and keep that momentum throughout the lifetime of the online experience. So we'd run all kinds of contests to try to encourage students to get involved in the first 24, 48, 78 hours, and that really helped to, to spark uh, engagement from that point forward. All right, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Melissa for a few moments, not only because I've talked far more than I need to, but because she's the expert in all this. So Melissa, what, do you, what can you tell us about moderating the social areas of the app? So with moderating the uh, chat room, at least, with the app, um, I use a lot of um, thought on this one. So uh, this is kind of like my main content building, where I decided that because of the um, social aspect of the chat room, we also needed some moderation or uh, moderators um, to oversee that room um, in case things got a little off topic. So with any social media, you know, like students like to um, obviously socialize. And sometimes that uh, content can be either inappropriate or just off topic of what we wanted it to be. So we started off with um, internal and partner moderators. So that meaning uh, we had student volunteers um, within our office uh, overseeing the chat room on a daily basis, and um, partnered moderators as well. So people like our international partners that we were working with um, had some student volunteers uh, in that same space of the chat room um, helping answer like international um, questions that domestic students weren't further able um, 
to answer. And so with that came obviously training, so students being able to properly um, assess the questions and better help them, um, as well as a Facebook group just um, internally within the moderators to make sure that if there were any questions that seemed either inappropriate and that needed to be flagged, they could be brought up in that Facebook group and talked about, or even just um, additional training, so things like wanting to keep engagement up um, in between like the first week of school and the second week when things start to get a little bit slow, or um, if students were having a lot of um, questions about one particular subject, we'd start brainstorming how we can make that into like a new content area of development and just maintaining that engagement with students um, within the fall 60 and summer 60. So I have to give Melissa a lot of credit. Um, she and her team really drove a lot of the engagement by posting a lot of really interesting and engaging content, stories about things that they were doing at the college, interesting things that were going on in Vancouver, questions that they thought students would get excited about. They were really, really good at keeping that engagement over time. So the, the student volunteers and staff that we had were really critical to our success. All right, one of the last things I'm going to talk about really quickly uh, is cost. Um, so I talked with the folks at Ready Education about how to discuss this with you folks. And the simple way of putting it is that every institution is going to be different because you're going to start in a different place and you're going to have different needs. So for us, um, the cost was partially subsidized because the DSU was an existing client. So they were already paying for access to the service. But when we brought this additional orientation on, there was an additional fee. Fortunately, we were able to share that with International because there was so much activity, so much need for this service with the International Department. So we actually split the remaining cost with that department and they were very happy to do so given the level of engagement that we got there. So I'm not going to give you the actual number because, again, it is going to be so different depending on your school and your circumstances. But what I'll tell you is it's about half of what we spent on food on any given year. And honestly, I think we got far better outcomes from the online orientation in this app than we did from serving them cheeseburgers. So, um, you know, I really encourage you, talk to your student union. There are over 100 institutions across Canada that are already on the Ready Education app, and you might be able to partner with them in the same way that we did. Okay, that is a ton of content. Um, I'm sorry that we went through that pretty quickly, but we wanted to give you as, um, as much information as possible in a limited period of time. Now we're going to um, turn things over to you guys um, to answer any questions that you may have about anything that we've talked about so far in the session today, whether it is um, some of the best practices that we learned the hard way over the years, different aspects of the actual product that we developed, how we developed it, the people that we worked with, Anything that might have come to your mind um, that you'd like clarification on, now would be a really great time for folks to ask those questions, so feel free to type those in now. Um, I know that we had a question a little bit earlier on in the session. Um, Kendra, I'm sorry that we didn't get back to you right away. Um, so your question was essentially, is there any way to get metrics on app usage that aren't self-reported? Yes. So the folks at um, Ready Education actually provided me with a Excel document that summarized the through rates for the different elements of the online orientation. So I can actually see how many students clicked on the domestic area versus the international versus varsity. And within those areas, I can see how many clicks there were on each tool. I could even see how many clicks there were on each of the subjects in the new student guide. And that information was super helpful in terms of helping us to identify where to put more time and resources. Um, in development for subsequent iterations. So absolutely, there's, there's much more analytics than I had time to share with you guys today. A lot of it's available on the dashboard for administrators who are using the app. Uh, second question here is from Janelle. Um, can we go back to the slide that broke down the bits that the students reported using the most? Uh, absolutely. So that was, as I was just saying, that was part of the um, click-through data that we got from the folks at Ready Education um, that helped us to understand um, what are the different elements that we built um, that were effective and what were maybe not as interesting to the students. Here it is here. So as you can see, new student guide, very, very popular because it provided them with hot topic information that was very action-oriented. Checklist was very popular. Chat room was very popular. Interestingly, the third most popular was uh, clubs and activities. Students were really looking for ways to, um, to get connected to other students that they had things in common with. Uh, and on the flip side, things that we thought were popular um, weren't as popular. So social media really didn't get a lot of uptake and um, 
what else? College slang. Um, so we're not going to put a lot more time into things like that. Video showcase. Uh, what we're going to do is focus on videos that are targeted on specific topics. Um, so we'll put a lot more video time and effort into our new student guide because we think that they're looking for video content that is um, productive as opposed to inspirational. Dean Howie. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, Dean used to work here back at the college years ago. Um, thanks for your compliments. Uh, he says, we struggle to engage our student clubs to use uh, the app, as there are so many means of communication out there. Any suggestions? Um, what I'll tell you from our experience is with adoption levels like this and engagement levels like this, if you can show them these numbers, I think it really um, makes an impression on the student leaders, the, the club leaders, that, hey, rather than setting up a table and losing six hours of your day, put yourself on the app. You're going to get far better response, far better uptake. Um, you're likely to drive a lot more engagement. I mean, the simple reality is it's kind of like um, that old um, quote. Uh, from Dillinger, you know, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. I think what we've learned this year is why would you put this stuff on an online app? Because that's where the students are. Um, you know, we got far better results here than anywhere else. So I think if you could show numbers like this to the student club leaders, um, I think they'd be really motivated to get more involved because they would see it as a really um, powerful way of driving adoption to their clubs. Uh, Kendra. Have you looked at using this platform to share orientation information specific to their academic programs? Great question. Um, so we actually had requests from students to create tailored areas for the different program areas because a lot of the times when they jumped into the chat rooms, the first thing they'd ask is, hey, is anybody else here from the computing studies program or from the nursing program? Uh, and so they were not only looking to make friends, they were looking to make friends in their programs. Um, the challenge, of course, is when you've got six different major faculty areas and 90 different programs, it has the potential to highly fragment the student population. Um, and, and I think what we, we wanted to do was to try to increase the likelihood of, of having a critical mass. So a large number of students in one area so that they have a sense of community and they see a lot of activity there. If you break it down into too many individual program areas, you might end up with only a few students in each spot it probably won't have the same feeling of energy and activity there. So um, we absolutely thought of that, and we may be thinking about it in the future. Um, I should actually say that that um, they're actually splitting our office's portfolio this year. So as I told you at the top, we're doing domestic student recruiting as well as orientation. They've actually split the portfolio, and they're, they've given orientation to another department in the college. So this is actually the last time that I'm going to get to work on online orientation here at Douglas. It's actually going over to another group, but um, this is one of my recommendations to them is to look at things like making it more program specific for those students. Um, so that's a great question and, and we definitely have been thinking about that. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes here. If folks have any other questions for us, uh, we are also going to skip down to the bottom of the presentation uh, to show our contact information because, as I said at the beginning, there is just so much that you could unpack in this, and we actually had to cut out a lot of material that we were going to bring in today um, because we just didn't have the time to get into it. But if this is something that you think is interesting or could be of value uh, to your students, please reach out. Um, I would be more than happy. I've had lots of conversations with different schools over the last six months about our experiences with this program. Um, and, and some really interesting conversations, uh, with, uh, especially with international student programs, um, looking for a way to engage that population even before the students arrive in Canada. So um, yeah, if you're looking for an opportunity to discuss this more, uh, please take some time and reach out. I'm always happy to, talk, happy to talk to you folks. Uh, we're winding down to the last minute or so of our presentation. Um, so what I want to do is thank everyone for being a part of the process today. Uh, we really hope that you have uh, found something useful in here, um, something that you can maybe bring back to your host institution. Uh, feel free to share the app with, uh, with anyone else, as you can see. It's publicly available, so anyone can download it to their phone, and that's a really great way of getting a sense for how it feels and how it might work. It's just um, get other folks to download it and, and take a look at what we've done. It's certainly not perfect, but uh, we've had some great results with it. Anyway, appreciate your time today, folks. Um, it was great having you on board. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon. In the meantime, have a great rest of your week. And if I don't talk to you before then, have a great winter season. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah and all the rest. It's been great having you with us. And uh, Melissa, thank you for your help today.
Thank you. All right, folks, take care, and we'll see you soon. Cool. Wow, could you imagine paying $12,000 of your own money? Uh, no, I could never, like, like, for your own endeavor, let alone yeah. <laughs> something. No, I know. Oh, He's crazy like that. What were you going to say, sorry? Oh, I just, I so badly wanted to do an online orientation. Evan was kind of against it. Not against well, it. Well, I, I fully support you doing an online orientation, and yes, I am crazy for spending that much money on it. <laughs>